Almost anywhere you go, if you hear a natural sound, it's probably from a bird. <laughs> Birds are very social and spend much of their day talking to each other. How they communicate expresses a feeling for life in that moment. Squeaks, hoots, rattles. Whistles. Chatter. And of course, songs. The variety is endless. Mostly we ignore it. But some bright spring morning, you might be startled by a sudden outpouring of song. And if you open your ears and listen, you might realize there's a whole world you can discover. Each year, nature lovers anxiously await the spring and the sudden arrival of hundreds of millions of colorful songbirds. If you learn the songs of some common migrants, you might hear them passing through your yard or on your street. But what about the wood warblers? It is most of all the wood warblers that delight bird watchers in the spring. And challenge their ears. Small insectivorous birds, they come from the tropics to nest in our forests. More than 25 species pass through New England and all of them are singing. While migrating, they are much tamer and easier to approach. It might seem hard to believe, but at the peak of migration, it's possible to hear the songs of two dozen species in a single day. It's an amazing concert. Wouldn't you like to hear it? Our hotspot will be Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This was the first planned garden cemetery in the country, and birds enjoy its diverse collection of well-maintained flowering trees. The best way to enjoy the spring migration and to learn bird songs is to find a local hotspot where good numbers of migrating songbirds are regularly seen. Plan to visit as much as you can during the peak of migration. When you're there, make a conscious effort to listen and notice the sounds you hear. Recordings can help, 
but there's no substitute for time in the field getting to know the birds in your area. Some songs are easy to learn if you give it a try. Such common birds can be found singing almost anywhere. and for many months of the year. With curiosity and patience, it's possible to learn the calls and songs of many other birds. As April begins, the trees are still bare, and some winter birds are still around. For most of the month, only a few warblers are passing through. It's a good time to get started learning the sounds of the common birds in your area. As you study bird songs, it will be a great help to have a feel for the birds you can generally expect to encounter on a given day. This chart represents an average sequence of warblers at Mount Auburn from the end of March to the start of June. Keep in mind that in a given year, abundance is not continuous like this. Migrants come in definite waves created by atmospheric conditions. This means migration tends to be concentrated into particular days. The pine warbler is the first of its kind to arrive, a month before most others. They winter across southern pine forests and don't have to wait for deciduous leaves to grow. Their song is a loud and pleasant trill coming from the pine trees. The chipping sparrow, common at the cemetery, can sound a lot like the pine warbler. But with some practice, you'll notice the sparrow sounds flatter and more metallic, less musical. A few days later, the palm warbler appears, pumping its tail up and down. Where the pine warbler trills, the palm tweets. They sound softer, less emphatic, almost like a mild chatter. Warblers in general sing higher and softer than other birds, so they can be harder to pick out from the ambient noise. You have to practice tuning into this frequency. True to their name, many make a warbling sound a repeated alternation around a single pitch. The warble is often followed by an ending on a higher pitch, as with the yellow rump warbler. First appearing around the middle of April, in a few weeks they rapidly become abundant, by far the most common warbler. There may be as many of them as all the others combined. But despite their abundance, their song isn't easy to learn. Did you hear that? They often sing quite faintly, as if they didn't want to be heard. If they sing loudly, it can seem like a different bird. Their songs are so often hard to place that some people find it easier to identify by their chip. They chip more than other warblers, and it's louder and more distinct. 
It's a hard and loud chip. While you're listening for warblers in April, there's a few more common birds that you need to know. In general, these birds don't sound like warblers at all, but you will hear them a lot. The warbling vireo is a conspicuous singer in many eastern woodlands. Its rapidly whistled pitch changes are quite memorable. The ruby-crowned kinglet is smaller than any warbler, and probably a better singer. This is really a song, not just a warble. Soon after April 20th, the black and white warbler shows up, working over the tree bark. Because they have a huge range, they have one of the longest periods of migration, as they can still be found in late May. It makes a loud, slow, and very high-pitched warble of 10 or 12 notes. This is one of the highest songs, but some birds at the end of migration sing even higher. Like the yellow rumped, they sometimes add improvisations after this warble. As April ends, migration suddenly quickens. In the next few days, just as Mount Auburn's trees rush into flower, seven or more species appear. Now, all at once, you might hear many different warblers singing. How many different birds can you hear with this black and white warbler? First in importance is the northern parallel. This is one of the most abundant migrants at Mount Auburn, and for many days in May, their loud songs fill the air. You need to know this species so you can hear the other songs. But it's not easy. It has many different versions. This is a typical song at Mount Auburn. This one is a fast glissando, rising to a staccato finish. Here's a curiously syncopated song. Listen to this unusual rolling song. It may help to focus on the quality of the perilous voice. They always sing with vibrato, a buzzing quality, and their songs usually have loud staccato notes. The black-throated green warbler is another herald of May. When you hear its song, you know that migration has begun in earnest. But it sings two stereotypical songs. 
The first is a repeated note, ending with a distinct warble, a classic warbler song. The second song is a distinctive five note sequence. Hitting five different pitches is unusual. No other warbler sings such a sequence of notes. The yellow warbler is a common summer breeder in riparian habitats across North America. There's likely a stream or pond near you where you can listen for them. This song is typical, a rapid fire of loud warbles. Hear that? That's a yellow warbler. But there are many different variations. Like other warblers, they can go into singing manias, particularly when many other birds are singing loudly. Here, one sings continuous loose phrases while foraging high in the trees. While he sings, a quartet of birds seems to synchronize their songs with him. Is it possible they're sharing a feeling with each other? There's no end to the observations you can make on bird sounds. Listen to this oriole. There's a robin singing in the background And this oriole is singing along, or mimicking the robin. Such mimicry happens more often than you might think. The prairie warbler has a delightful song. A slow ascending scale of notes. No other bird sounds out a scale like this. The Nashville warbler is not as colorful as its cousins and often hidden in flowering trees, but it has a very distinctive song. A hard and loud warble, followed by rapid chipping, which ends abruptly. This can be the loudest warbler in early May. In the same flowering trees, we sometimes find the blue-winged warbler. Uncommon at best, and retiring when present. Their songs are a bit mysterious, sounding like an insect or a strange exhalation. The black-throated blue warbler tends to be lower in trees, scooting along larger branches. It has a flat, rough voice with a lower and repeated note, finishing on an emphatic higher note.
It may be faster or slower, with more notes, but the voice and pattern are consistent. By the 10th of May, the largest group of warblers, more than 10 species, appears. That means for the next 10 days, the two or three peak nights of migration could bring more than two dozen species to Mount Auburn. Who knows what might appear? The rarities tend to be more southern breeds, which have overshot their range. Birds like the worm-eating warbler or the cerulean warbler or something even more unusual. Now is the time to go bird watching every day if you can. Each day will be different and interesting. If you can't do that, the question becomes when to go. This depends on weather patterns. A typical pattern involves a stalled frontal boundary over the mid-Atlantic. This happens when the Southern High Pressure Dome, or Bermuda High, lifts over the southeast. This high pressure greatly assists birds crossing the western Gulf of Mexico, giving them strong south and southwest winds that push them in a sweeping direction up the Mississippi and Ohio valleys toward the northeast, where they finally run into the stalled front. Above the front, cold north winds block flight. It's not uncommon for one or two of these blocking patterns to develop in the first two weeks of May. Birds will pile up, waiting for a shift. When the stalled front finally lifts, the wind shifts to the southwest across the mid-Atlantic and into New England, releasing a wave of migration across the Hudson River, all the way to the Atlantic. Similar waves can be created by faster-moving cold fronts, which bring a brief but intense period of southwest winds. Birds will then readily migrate such cold fronts create local fallouts of hundreds or thousands of birds, especially at the coast. To catch any of these waves, you want to watch for the days when the winds shift to the southwest. That's the night when the birds will be moving. Now is the time you want to be out at the crack of dawn if possible. The sound of the dawn chorus can be overwhelming. The loud singing of this cardinal temporarily drowns out the other birds, but when he stops, six or more warblers immediately sing in a long chain. This is what spring is all about. On these special days, warblers are singing everywhere. It's an amazing experience and a unique opportunity to hear more than 20 species in a few hours of the morning. It's always nice to see a northern water thrush. They pace beside streams and ponds like a miniature sandpiper. Their song is an accelerated series of loud, sweet notes.
Now, the American Red Start becomes one of the most common migrants. They have a high and shrill voice with rather plain song that can be hard to learn. One way to identify the red start is by their strong habit of rapidly repeating their song as they flit from branch to branch. Most warblers can sing repeatedly at times, but the red start seems to do it almost exclusively. The common yellow throat likes to be low in bushes and shrubs, where it sings a syncopated three-note warble three or four times. The magnolia warbler, a favorite for many, becomes abundant in the third week of May. Like the yellow throat, it has a distinctly syncopated song, but the pattern is different. The chestnut-sided warbler, like the yellow warbler and the northern water thrush, has a bright, sweet voice. You can think of it as a cheerful song with three or four parts. The oven bird is another walking warbler, like the water thrush. Sometimes you can find them walking around little grassy areas in gardens or parks. They have a simple, easy to learn song. It's a creaky warble, which always crescendos from soft to quite loud. No other warbler song crescendos like this. The Wilson's warbler is one of the smallest, and it has a bubbly and excited song. It sounds like a rapid jumble of notes.
the Tennessee warbler is easy to overlook, looking much like a leaf high in the canopy. But the song is hard to forget. The pattern is like its cousin, the Nashville warbler, but louder. Mount Auburn is so attractive to migrants because of its combination of numerous flowering trees and many large mature oaks like red, white, black, scarlet, or pin oak. These oaks host hundreds of kinds of moths, butterflies, and other flying insects, whose spring abundance and larval form coincides with the arrival of the warblers. The agility and acrobatic skill of warblers in feeding on this seasonal insect life has allowed them to proliferate across all North American forests. As a family, they forage across the whole surface of the woods, skipping across the bark, sliding over every branch, fluttering out to the tips of the leaves and flowers, hopping in the leaf litter, and pacing the water's edge, It's this versatility which allows them to find their way each year from the tropics to the boreal forest and back again. It's obvious that these birds serve a vital function for our trees. If they didn't arrive each spring, damaging outbreaks of many insects could occur. The health of our forest ecosystems depends on these small birds arriving from thousands of miles away every year. The life history of one warbler in particular, the Cape May, is shaped by regular damaging outbreaks of the spruce budworm in the boreal forest. They congregate on these outbreaks and raise much larger broods, their population fluctuating with the budworm. These Cape Mays are feeding on a sycamore maple planted at Mount Auburn. They have a unique tube-shaped tongue which allows them to drink nectar, something they specialize in during the Caribbean winter. Their song is extremely high. It may be simple high notes or something more complex. Now, the true boreal migrants are arriving. Curiously, all these species have very high-pitched voices, as high or higher than the black and white and red star. These songs can be hard to pick out above other birds, and even harder to identify. The Blackburnian warbler has a shrill quality like the red star. They can sound very similar.
and they also hit very high notes at the end. The black pole warbler arrives in small numbers from the beginning of May, but after May 20th, they become the most common warbler as others rapidly depart. They have a very high-pitched song, but often slow and almost lazy. They can sound a lot like the black and white warbler, but usually softer lower and a bit higher. Perhaps the most characteristic of these boreal birds is the bay-breasted warbler. Although they're here for hardly more than a week, they can be easy to find on the best days. Their song is a high, soft, and irregular warble. At first, it seems to lack any distinct pattern. However, the tone is usually centered on a single pitch, almost the same pitch the black pole sings at. That's why, although their songs look very different, they can sometimes sound just like a black pole. The same waves that bring so many migrants to Mount Auburn bring considerably more to hot spots along the Atlantic coast. Pushed by southwest winds, many birds easily reach the Gulf of Maine in a single flight. Many continue flying over the ocean. But as dawn approaches, more and more birds will stop at the coast until migration ceases completely. As the sun rises, radar shows some birds returning to the coast it seems that when there is enough light for them to see the distant coastline, some, perhaps many miles out to sea, turn around and head back to land. These conditions can bring great masses of migrants to our rare coastal woodlands. The biggest here, Plum Island, may have thousands of warblers isolated in the large estuary of the Merrimack and Parker Rivers. Migrants are attracted to a narrow line of dense thickets that stretches for four or five miles along the center of the island. The oak trees along the refuge road can be filled with all the boreal migrants, where they may be easily seen. These birds seem to be delighted with a swarm of tiny flies. They are snapping them right out of the air. If you can identify all these very high-pitched songs just by hearing them, congratulations, you are a black belt birder. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, the black rain. Yeah. That's a black rain, I think. Yeah. The Canada warbler sings a rapid tumble of notes with a loud, sweet voice. Listen for the characteristic chip at the start of their song. From here, these birds could migrate along the coast to their breeding ranges to the northeast. It wouldn't be much of a detour, but they don't. For nearly all of them, their next flight will be directly over the ocean and across the Gulf of Maine. This averaging of radar trajectories shows the relative intensity of spring migration in each direction. There is a flow of birds straight from the New York area to Boston, which then continues over the Gulf of Maine. This flight can be seen on radar after sunset, when birds along the coast take flight and move in a line over the ocean. It's over 200 miles across the Gulf from Boston to eastern Maine. It's over 300 miles up the Bay of Fundy. If we guess they fly about 30 miles an hour, that's 7 to 10 hours of continuous flight, more if there's any wind resistance. The simple and amazing fact is that, for almost all these birds, crossing this distance just isn't very hard. Despite being so very small, they are supremely adapted to make the journey. Back at Mount Auburn, the rhododendrons are finally blooming. As May ends, there is a rapid decline in migration and the cemetery is quiet. A few thrushes, the odd black pole. Now is when the last species appears. The morning warbler is not only rare, but generally shy, usually staying deep in undergrowth. 
This is a tough bird to get to know. To film one singing at Mount Auburn is not so easy. Here is one in October Mountain State Forest, one of the only populations in Massachusetts. They have a rich, thrush-like voice that tends to end on a lower note. I hope you've enjoyed learning about warbler songs, and I hope you'll soon have the chance to enjoy the sounds of birds somewhere near you.